Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone now uh, is present. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone to our third webinar, uh, the RMI TED webinar, the Red Meat Institute for Transformation and Enterprises Development. Uh, today we have in our midst uh, one of the stakeholders that uh, uh, within the red meat industry, uh, that is uh, Dr. Cyril Mavua. Mavua is with the, uh, the OVP. So today is going to take us through the presentation of uh, the implementation of a vaccination program, the cattle vaccination program just to give insight as to how you as the farmers uh, you should go about in terms of uh, vaccinating your cattle to prevent the diseases as we all know that the prevention is better than cure so uh, this is within our vision as the red meat institute for transformation and enterprises development uh, to foster stakeholder engagement uh, towards inclusive growth through the transfer of knowledge. Uh, so this aligns very well with our vision as the RMI TED. So we're going to give uh, Dr. Serlo Mavue a chance to take us through his presentation. And thereafter, we're going to allow questions. If you have questions uh, throughout the, the presentation, you can just drop them uh, in box here. We're going to read them through just after the presentation. And you also have an opportunity to raise up your hand uh, and, and we can allow you after the presentation to, uh, to, to ask any question of your interest uh, in relation to, to the vaccination program. Uh, this is quite important because some of our farmers, they are always struggling in terms of disease control. So take this opportunity and listen carefully and, and, and note down your questions so that uh, after the presentation, we can be able to, to, to ask the question uh, to one of our experts within the industry. Uh, I'm just going to hand over the presentation now to Dr. Silo Mavue to take us through. Uh, Dr. Mavue. Uh, the platform is yours. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to put up the slides and then we can hit the road. Can everyone see the presentation? Can we get a thumbs up or something, an indication? Okay, thank you. Uh, today we're going to talk about cattle vaccination and how we go about implementing a vaccination program. Uh, and us as honestly poor biological products, you might be wondering where exactly do we fit in? Uh, and I've actually just done this uh, small demonstration to show that we actually come in right at the top there with, with health and health management of these animals. But all these things actually work together uh, for us to get the best out of the health of our animals. Uh, we assume firstly that we've chosen the right animals for what we want to do, and we've chosen the best environment uh, for them. And we're also making an assumption that they have access to adequate nutrition. And then at the very top there, the health, because all the three cannot actually be separated. You need to actually have all three of them working hand in hand. For the same reason that we don't medicate hungry animals uh, to take care of their nutritional needs and vice versa. So in terms of the outline for today, 
Hopefully by the time we finish, we'll have answered the following questions. What the vaccine is or what they are, how they work, how we vaccinate animals, why we vaccinate animals, and which diseases uh, we should be concerned about, which specific animals to target, is there a specific time of the year, and if we have access to vaccines, how do we go about administering them? So the first question being, what is, what is a vaccine? It's a type of medicine that trains the body's immune response or immune system so that it can fight the disease uh, that it has not encountered uh, before. Uh, it is therefore designed to rather prevent the disease instead of treating a disease. It may sound oversimplified, but for as long as I still hear farmers telling me they have vaccinated with teramycin, it says to me we have not actually done a good job in clarifying the difference. And one way one can also look at it is uh, think about an army that has to protect the country. They consistently have to be training. And you can imagine if you have an army that doesn't train, what happens when the war actually reaches our borders? So if we can put it simply, try and think of the immune system as the soldiers that have to take care uh, of, of, of whatever the body has to encounter when we're talking uh, animals. It can even be applied to humans. In fact, one other way we can actually demonstrate this uh, when we're talking uh, how many vaccines can you administer at a time, for the same reason, when you go to a gym, an instructor would ask you, what are your objectives? Do you want to lose weight? Do you want a six pack? Do you want to focus on your biceps? Do you want chest? Do you want legs? It is for the same reason that when we put together a vaccination program, we need to understand what we're trying to achieve, how we're going to prioritize a certain diseases and which we can actually leave out of the vaccination program if, for example, your resources are a limiting factor. Uh, I've mentioned what a vaccination is. It's, it's basically the act of administering a vaccine uh, to animals. Uh, and this is only part of actually doing the immunization job. If you've given it to the right animal, for example, if you read a lot of package insets, they will tell you that the vaccine needs to be given to a healthy animal. You do not wait until an animal is sick and then you actually administer a vaccine. There you've actually done the act of administering a vaccine. So you have vaccinated, but you have not immunized an animal, for example. I'm going to try and play a video that I have uh, put on the slides for you and then we can quickly uh, continue afterwards. In 1796, the scientist Edward Jenner injected material from a cowpox virus into an eight-year-old boy with a hunch that this would provide the protection needed to save people from deadly outbreaks of the related smallpox virus. It was a success. The eight-year-old was inoculated against the disease, and this became the first ever vaccine. But why did it work? To understand how vaccines function, we need to know how the immune system defends us against contagious diseases in the first place. When foreign microbes invade us, the immune system triggers a series of responses in an attempt to identify and remove them from our bodies. The signs that this immune response is working are the coughing, sneezing, inflammation, and fever we experience, which work to trap, deter, and rid the body of threatening things like bacteria. These innate immune responses also trigger our second line of defense, called adaptive immunity. Special cells called B cells and T cells are recruited to fight microbes and also record information about them, creating a memory of what the invaders look like and how best to fight them. This know-how becomes handy if the same pathogen invades the body again. 
But despite this smart response, there's still a risk involved. The body takes time to learn how to respond to pathogens and to build up these defenses. And even then, if a body is too weak or young to fight back when it's invaded, it might face very serious risk if the pathogen is particularly severe. But what if we could prepare the body's immune response, readying it before someone even got ill? This is where vaccines come in. Using the same principles that the body uses to defend itself, scientists use vaccines to trigger the body's adaptive immune system without exposing humans to the full-strength disease. This has resulted in many vaccines, which each work uniquely, separated into many different types. First, we have live attenuated vaccines. These are made of the pathogen itself, but a much weaker and tamer version. Next, we have inactive vaccines, in which the pathogens have been killed. The weakening and inactivation in both types of vaccine ensures that pathogens don't develop into the full-blown disease. But just like a disease, they trigger an immune response, teaching the body to recognize an attack by making a profile of pathogens in preparation. The downside is that live attenuated vaccines can be difficult to make, and because they're live and quite powerful, people with weaker immune systems can't have them, while inactive vaccines don't create long-lasting immunity. Another type, the subunit vaccine, is only made from one part of the pathogen, called an antigen, the ingredient that actually triggers the immune response. By even further isolating specific components of antigens, like proteins or polysaccharides, these vaccines can prompt specific responses. Scientists are now building a whole new range of vaccines called DNA vaccines. For this variety, they isolate the very genes that make the specific antigens the body needs to trigger its immune response to specific pathogens. When injected into the human body, those genes instruct cells in the body to make the antigens. This causes a stronger immune response and prepares the body for any future threats. And because the vaccine only includes specific genetic material, it doesn't contain any other ingredients from the rest of the pathogen that could develop into the disease and harm the patient. If these vaccines become a success, we might be able to build more effective treatments for invasive pathogens in years to come. Just like Edward Jenner's amazing discovery spurred on modern medicine all those decades ago, continuing the development of vaccines might even allow us to treat diseases like HIV, malaria, or Ebola one day. Okay, uh, we're going to continue. So basically, if we can summarize the vaccine is small amount of harmless form of the disease, uh, like you've heard in the video, that we introduce into the body and, and the body actually stores memory or antibodies to fight the disease when it comes across it again. Uh, then the next question is, why do we do it? Uh, is it just fun out there to be pricking animals with needles and packing them into crush pens and causing them unnecessary pain? Actually not. Uh, it is a cornerstone of animal welfare. Uh, I mean, we've all grown up hearing about how prevention is always better than cure. And that is for various reasons. One being that prevention is always way cheaper than having to uh, cure a disease. And the second reason being, if you actually looking for curing a disease, you're already running behind the disease. And you're not even guaranteed a recovery from whatever curative intervention uh, one may be looking at. Sometimes, we catch sick animals too late and they still die even after we've treated them. Second one is we also know that healthy animals improve health for all. And, and, and one can immediately think of diseases that are transmissible between animals and humans. 
Uh, for example, this this month we're actually commemorating a rabies month. Uh, one of the things we actually sometimes don't uh, emphasize is the fact that rabies kills 60,000 people annually all over the world. And yet it's a disease that is preventable with a vaccine. And it is also a disease that once the signs start showing, that uh, treatment doesn't bring much success. In fact, very little success has been ever reported uh, with attempting to treat a rabies patient. But we also know that when the animals are healthy, they are productive and they produce healthy food. I'm sure nobody wants to go and buy milk uh, if you know the cow that got milked that day was not a very healthy cow. So we believe in, in the, the health that we get from uh, or the healthy food we get from the animals also make it or, or, or help us to ensure that we don't have to be queuing in hospital queues uh, worrying about diseases that we would have gotten from an animal. Uh, the third one being agricultural sustainability. Obviously, if you're not going to be productive in the farming, uh, you're not going to make profit and you're not going to last a long time in the farming space. Uh, it is also reported yeah. that uh, all over the world, uh, about 20% of livestock losses is attributed to animal disease. And when we talk losses, it's not always losses because the animals died. Sometimes animals that don't die cost you more. If they are sick, you have to spend money on their medication. If they stay sick, sometimes they eat more than other animals and they still get they get to give you nothing in terms of weight gains and things like that. Or they generally perform poorly, uh, which can affect your profit margins in a business. Uh, one of the reasons also we try to prevent disease as much as possible is to reduce our reliance on antimicrobial agents. There is a whole uh, movement globally to reduce the usage of antimicrobials, and that is following the association of the use of antimicrobials uh, with antimicrobial resistance in humans as well. So the more we get exposed to these antimicrobials in our animals, there's always a risk that uh, there will be a possibility that one day when you're sick and you need the same active ingredient, it might not work. So the whole idea is to always try as much as possible to keep the animals uh, at a much higher level of resistance in comparison to the challenge they face or if we have to put it simply, keeping them away from the flood line or as high above the flood line as possible. I mean, we we can think of a, a perfect daily life example with us where we say, if you don't want your house to be flooded, don't build on a river bank. The further away you are from the river bank, the lesser the risk of you ever being flooded. And it works the same way with with the with with the insurance that we build uh, into our animals with vaccination, and one could also ask which diseases do I have to worry about? Uh, first and foremost, we worry about diseases that have an economic impact, either on you as a farmer individually, or an economic impact on uh, a country, for example. If you have diseases that no trade partner wants to deal with, they block everything that you produce and you can't export meat or any meat related products. Uh, and then you get also diseases that animals recover on their own and, and, and you don't really see much of an economic impact. The second level would also be as per legislation, for example, in South Africa, we have controlled diseases in terms of our Animal Diseases Act, where the vaccination is compulsory. So you do not actually have a choice legally as a farmer, for example, whether or not you're going to vaccinate your animals for brucellosis. 
if you own an animal, if you own a, a cow, you have to vaccinate uh, between four and eight months of age, for example. And then we look also at diseases that are common, uh, respiratory diseases, for example, you will find them where you find animals because the pathogens that cause respiratory disease, they live there like your what we call normal flora in the upper respiratory tract. It's only when they evade the normal mechanisms of defense that they go further down into the respiratory system, into the lungs and cause pneumonias, uh, for example. So these diseases, if you can prevent them, it's always better because even if you can heal pneumonia with an antibiotic, it does not reverse the damage that's already been caused. It only limits further damage from being caused by the, uh, the pathogens. And if one looks at examples of clostridial diseases, uh, things like black cotta and botulism, uh, one, these diseases, like I mentioned, they do not have treatment or the treatment is very seldom successful. And some of the animals might even die so fast that you will not going to get a chance to do anything anyway. So respiratory diseases, clostridial, and these are just examples. There's many others which I will touch into towards the end of the presentation. Then we have diseases that are called zoonotic, meaning that they can be passed from animals to humans. And brucellosis is one of them, like I mentioned, rabies is one of them. If we can prevent these diseases in animals, we don't have to worry about the disease in humans. And then the next level is, is, is affordability. In all honesty, when it comes to affordability, if you own an animal, if you have already invested in an animal that cost you 10,000 rand, surely you can invest a few rands, uh, often less than 10 rand, to protect that animal against the disease and to protect yourself against the disease if it's a disease that can be transmitted uh, to man as well. In terms of the economic impact of these diseases, I've mentioned, I've, I've put up here lumpy skin disease as an example, because a lot of times we see just the no, no, noblies on the skin and we see the lumps on the skin and we assume that's the only problem. But if lumpy skin breaks out in a dairy, for example, you get a severe reduction in milk yield. And the challenge with a reduction in milk yield uh, especially if you're in dairy, that's the core of your business. If you're in beef, uh, indirectly, you still have animals or calves that rely on that milk for growth. But one of the other complications that come with a lumpy skin, because it affects the skin, even on the teats of the animal, you get mastitis. And then you have to spend money on treating mastitis as well. Uh, the disease will also reduce the hide quality. In a lot of places, we say the value of the hide in an animal may be plus minus 20% of the animal's uh, worth. If you can think about it, if you have to sell an animal that has lumpy skin and, 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 and the skin or the hide is not going to be usable, you're already losing a certain percentage of the, of the, of the price if you are lucky enough to even get a buyer for a sick animal. And then we have animals that consistently lose weight because with lumpy skin, for example, they sometimes get oral ulcers, which makes it difficult for them to feed. And if they're not eating, they're definitely going to lose uh, uh, weight. And obviously in a beef uh, space, for example, where we get paid per kilogram, when that weight is lost, so is money getting lost in the process. Uh, another way uh, we never actually uh, speak about another loss uh, with regards to lumpy skin disease is infertility. We see this quite often in bulls. Uh, when mature sperm that is already sitting in the scrotum ready uh, to be delivered and, and, and give you your return on investment, 
in in the form of calves. Uh, when this animal gets uh, lumpy skin diseases, the seed in the in in the testes there gets killed. And then if you're a seasonal breeder and you have a bull with the cows for only two months, that two months that he spends recovering from a disease may be a two months of zero calves in the next calving season. Uh, and then once in a while you do, and in fact, while still on the bulls, the bulls do recover from the uh, fertil infertility. It may be temporary infertility that you get. Uh, and if you're lucky, the bulls with, will recover. But it's never a guaranteed full recovery. And that can actually have long term effects if this is a bull you intend to keep for a couple of years in your breeding herd. The next uh, is your abortions. Uh, we see this quite often in pregnant animals. When they are very sick uh, with a viral infection like this, where a body will try and fight the infection and there will be a fever, uh, that fever may actually uh, affect an unborn calf uh, leading to an abortion. And then worst case scenario is animals that eventually end up dead. Lumpy skin is not supposed to kill a lot of animals, but when they are in that state of immune compromise, they tend to get a lot of secondary complications and a lot of them succumb to pneumonias. And then sometimes you have to euthanize these animals, unfortunately. I've put this map here uh, to show if you need information around diseases in a specific area where you are in the country and you're not sure how to go about. Well, the first point would be to speak to your local vet, your local animal health technician, but this information is also available freely on the internet. Ruvasa here is the Ruminant Veterinary Association of South Africa. We have at any point in time plus minus 150 practices uh, reporting all over the country. And this is voluntary reporting that is not necessarily mandatory for vets to report, but such reports actually make it easy if you want to make a decision about the vaccination program based on the specific location in the country. So these red dots here on the map represents the practices all over the country that are reporting diseases they encounter. So if you live in the free state, you can rest comfortably knowing that the private vets in the free state are doing their parts uh, to convey awareness about what's, what could be happening in their area. And, and this map is also very important when it comes to putting together a vaccination program. You will notice as much as I spoke about lumpy skin, there are certain diseases that will occur only in certain parts of the country, which you can comfortably leave out of your vaccination program, for example. Unfortunately, lumpy skin is not one of them. Uh, this is just a picture for people that don't know what lumpy skin looks like. Some of the animals may not necessarily always have uh, lumps, but they may have edema or swelling of the dew lap here. Uh, this is one dead one that uh, I had to go out to see. Uh, and then you'll see the lacrimation or the discharge from the eyes that comes with these animals as well. Uh, this lumpy skin, for example, there's no province in South Africa that doesn't have the disease. You can see all those blue dots is all the areas in the country that have reported lumpy skin in 2022, for example. So when we talk about a cattle vaccination program, for example, if it doesn't have lumpy skin in it, then it's an incomplete vaccination program. Then you should be asking yourself, what is it that you are actually missing out? And, and because I've also mentioned that a lot of these animals would succumb to secondary pneumonias, you know that uh, you have to do something for pneumonias as well. And you will see we've added pasturella, for example, in your vaccination program as well. Uh, this is just a map to show why you cannot afford not to have vaccination for lumpy skin. 
Uh, most of Africa has lumpy skin disease. Most of uh, the Asian countries will have lumpy skin disease. So it's a disease that you definitely need to have in your vaccination program. And, and one also has to remember that about 1.3 uh, billion people worldwide to rely on livestock production. And unfortunately, majority of them actually sit in low middle income countries, which is mostly in Asia and Africa. So the impact of disease on animals has actually a much more impact on humans that rely on those animals than anywhere else in the country, for example. And then the next question is, you have animals in front of you that have to be vaccinated. Uh, if you remember at the time when we had uh, COVID or at the peak of COVID in South Africa, uh, and the government was pushing for maximum vaccination, the more animals you can have vaccinated, the better. And that's where we get our herd immunity. If you have 70% or 80% uh, of the animals covered, you know that the, 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 the community's uh, vulnerability is, 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 is greatly improved in that way. There are sometimes situations where you have a vaccine and it's not enough and you have to prioritize which animals can you take a risk with. Uh, in intensive farming situations, we always want to cover as many animals as possible. Uh, we want to look at your most vulnerable, your, your young ones, the ones that have never been vaccinated before. And also keeping in mind that at that age, their immune system is not fully developed. So while adult animals might fight the disease on their own, the young ones may not have that ability to fight the disease on their own. Uh, and then the next question would be when you have these vaccines, when do you uh, administer them? The question of when, uh, normally we want to say when you anticipate the risk. For example, if we talk about diseases that are transmitted by insects, we know insects uh, breed when there's moisture and a bit of warmth. So now going into the rainy season, we know we expect insect-borne diseases. This is actually the time to make sure that your animals are fully protected before the rainy season actually comes. Uh, if you wait, uh, chances are you may be vaccinating animals that already have the disease, which may not help you much. Uh, and in terms of uh, certain diseases that are not uh, controlled by the season, you have to make sure that annually at least your animals receive uh, the, 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 the vaccine as well as the booster doses. So a lot of the vaccines will actually tell you on the packaging set if you need a booster or if it's the same animal you've been vaccinating, you can actually just do a, 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 an annual vaccination without a booster that we normally say four to six weeks later. Then you have other vaccines, for example, your brucellosis, uh, the S19 uh, uh, strain, we vaccinate animals with that one once off. So once you have it in your vaccination program, yes, it stands there in your vaccination program, but it's only for animals, for example, that have never been vaccinated before. Your heifers that are four to eight months old. This is just a, a suggested program. You will see this also on the uh, OBP website that we have put on there. But we also recognize that some areas will uh, have different requirements. Uh, for example, in areas of the country where there's no hot water, for example, there's no need for you to be worrying about uh, vaccinating animals for hot water, unless if it's animals that are about to move into a hot water area, for example. Uh, then we have Rift Valley fever, uh, paratyphoid, uh, pasturella, when they are three to eight weeks uh, of age, they should ideally be getting their second injection as well. Uh, I've placed the 
S19 there as well, the brucella that we've spoken about. Uh, we've got anaplasmosis, the clostridial diseases that I've mentioned there, that's black water and botulism. Sometimes you get them in a combination uh, a vaccine that can deliver all of them at once. So, but this is basically all the essential vaccines that one needs to have a look at. And depending where you are or whether you've experienced the disease before, you can actually have additional vaccines included in your vaccination program. Uh, and I've placed the red water here, for example. Red water, we still have the very old vaccine where we inject them actual blood uh, with the pathogens that have been weakened. And then we have two types, the African as well as the Asiatic red water. And the reason we always encouraged for the vaccination with uh, for, for red water, especially the Asiatic one, when the animals have it, they tend to die very fast. So there's not even time for you to try and intervene with a treatment, for example. And one can actually take this further and say, in as far as the disease prevention is concerned and putting together preventative programs and we implement them, we win against the disease. But how do we actually make sure that we keep on this winning pattern and it doesn't become a once off? Because if you think about it, a disease like lumpy skin is 94 years old. It's eight years old in South Africa. It's a disease that comes back every single year. There are people that know about it, that do everything that is needed to prevent it, but there's others that don't know. If you are aware of a disease and you don't even say anything to your neighbor, your neighbor's animals, when they are vulnerable, yours become equally vulnerable sometimes, even, they, even if they are vaccinated, because no single vaccine will give you 100% protection. So if we share awareness and we raise it everywhere, the more people we can uh, bring to the table in as far as vaccinating uh, animals, uh, actually the better for everyone. Uh, and if we are aware, the question, the next question is, what level of preparedness uh, do we have? Are we always going to be the ones that run looking for a vaccine when there's a disease outbreak? Or do we actually go proactively up front and say, August, September, we make sure that the animals are fully uh, vaccinated. And that way you can also rest assured that you can focus on other things as well. Uh, we need to make sure that we, we, we control a disease when it comes. Uh, and, and vaccination is one of the ways we can actually control the spread or limit the spread uh, of the disease when it, when it comes. And obviously the next level is the availability of resources. Uh, if one looks at what, what it costs to vaccinate for certain diseases, sometimes we have a challenge in mobilizing resources. But if you own livestock and you can plan ahead you can actually sell a few animals and make sure that by the time you need resources such as vaccines, the vaccines are actually there to, to administer to animals as well. So the take home message from our today's webinar is if the message has gotten through to, even if it's just one or two people and you do things differently uh, going forward in as far as your a uh, farming journey is concerned, I will be a very happy person. And I want to thank everyone for the time. And there's our contact details if you need to speak to us at any point. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Silo Maboe. That was a quite informative uh, presentation. And I hope everyone who attended it uh, uh, was able to learn one or two things. And now we are going to get into a very important session of discussion. So, but this is how it's going to go about. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, 
uh, Dr. Mabo, a few questions that I have with me here. And thereafter, we are going to open the platform for everyone to ask questions. Uh, the question can be dropped in our box, or you can just, uh, once recognized, unmute yourself and be able to, answer, um, to ask the question of your interest. Right. Uh, Dr. Mabui, I just have a few questions that I would like to ask you here in relation to the vaccination program. Or the vaccines you mentioned one of the very important uh, uh, element that especially that has to do with the uh, lumpy skin disease that it affects the fertility and it affects uh, at times it can cause abortions to to cows as well so but in the question it has to do with uh, the pregnant cattle uh, the pregnant cattle need to be vaccinated and if the answer is yes, uh, for what diseases they need to vaccinate it for? OK, thank, thank you, Ernest, for, for the question. The commercial vaccines currently available in South Africa are safe for use in pregnant animals. But I always encourage farmers to read the package insert in case there is a new a vaccine that has entered the market and, and, and we don't want to make assumptions. So if there is a specific warning against vaccinating pregnant animals, it will be placed as a warning in the package insert. If one looks at a vaccine like the OBP, lumpy skin disease, uh, the work on safety in pregnant animals many years ago was not actually considered very critical. So if you look at that package insert, it probably is not going to say anything to you about safety in pregnancy. But I want to take this a few steps back. The disease is 63 years old. If you look at the traditional uh, vaccination programs where we say vaccinate for lumpy skin between August and September, in terms of our traditional breeding programs in South Africa, that's when most cows are pregnant in South Africa, especially for guys that breed in summer. So around August, September, majority of those animals will be pregnant. They have been vaccinated with the lumpy skin disease for many, many years. Like I said, the, the vaccine in, in human years, it's close to a retirement age, but they don't, they, they, they carry on being effective vaccines even in pregnant animals. The other advantage also is uh, when calves get born and they consume colostrum from their mothers, those antibodies against lumpy skin will protect the calves in those early uh, stages of life while we're waiting for them to be ready to take their own vaccine. I hope I've answered the question. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you answered my question very well. And I hope uh, everyone who is listening managed to get the answer uh, that he gave to regarding the pregnancy cattle that need to be vaccinated. Uh, my second answer to you, Dr. Mavue, it has to do with uh, uh, the vaccination of pregnant cattle as well. So, but I just want to know now about in terms of vaccination of a pregnant cattle. If it happens that someone or a farmer somewhere in the country vaccinate a pregnant cattle by mistake using the vaccination that is not required to vaccinate pregnant cattle, what are the consequences? Okay. If you vaccinate Let's use any vaccine, for example. If you use a vaccine that's not supposed to be used in pregnant animals, the worst that can happen is an abortion. Uh, and with other vaccines we've seen, depending on the stage of the pregnancy, you might actually end up uh, with a, a fetus that comes malformed. Uh, and what do I mean by malformed? Uh, in the development stages of a, a lamb or a calf inside uh, the mother, 
it starts when the egg and the sperm come together and they go through all the development developmental stages. So when the animal has already become a full animal inside the womb, for example, it's very rare that anything can actually happen to that pregnancy. That is why some of the uh, vaccines will actually specify when is it safe to vaccinate a pregnant animals. And some of the vaccines will be contraindicated for use in early pregnancy, for example. But if you, for example, give a, a blue tongue vaccine or a horse sickness vaccine to a, a, an animal that is already in advanced pregnancy, there's always a good chance that nothing will actually happen. And you'll see a lot of the warnings that actually happen on, that are printed on the package inset, they will say to you the animal may abort. So the question sometimes becomes, in an outbreak situation where we are actually forced to do something, which one is actually the better evil to deal with? An animal that's going to drop dead because it uh, got infected, or an animal that we can save with a vaccine, lose the fetus and hopefully recover the animal and rebreed the animal and still have the genetics that you're not losing. Because if you're going to skip vaccinating pregnant animals in the middle of an outbreak, there's a very good chance that you will lose both the mother and the unborn fetus. Very thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mabue. Just now I'm going to open the platform to everyone, everyone who has a question relating to vaccination of uh, cattle. You are more than welcome to raise up your hand. Don't be shy. Uh, for those who are shy, you also have an opportunity to write down your questions in our inbox. So I'm going to go through the questions after taking some hands so that uh, all of your concerns can be uh, clarified. Uh, this is the only opportunity that we have. Uh, it's one of the opportunities that we have to engage with one of our experts, uh, a qualified vet who can give you guidance in terms of the vaccination of your cattle. So now I'm going to start with uh, hands that are up. I see uh, Mr. Dindwe, uh, your hand is up. Uh, may you please unmute your mic? and then so that you can ask the question to uh, Dr. Mabue. Uh, Mr. Dindre, unmute yourself and ask the question. Mr. Dindre, unmute yourself, please. Uh, Mr. Dindre, can you hear us? Your hand is up. Can you please unmute yourself and, and ask the question? Okay, it seems we are struggling with Mr. Dindre. Uh, simultaneously, we're gonna just go to our inbox and read some of the questions that we have, uh, that we got from, from you guys. And so that uh, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Mavoy can be able to answer some of those questions. And, and, and even those who have got more questions, please raise up your hand. I see Taba Marana, is, his hand is up. Uh, Tava Marana, can you ask the question? Unmute your mic, please. Uh, Tava Marana, platform is yours. Uh, Tava Marana? Okay, it seems we still have problem with uh, also Tava Marana, so I'm just going to go through the questions for now. Uh, the first question that we got is from Mr. Solomon Molefe. Uh, I'm Solomon, could, you, could I get a template of logging or processing of my cattles when I do the physical checks? Uh, he sent his email address. How can I work on disease prevention at farm level to better protect my animals? Dr. Mabue? Okay, the, the, the key one for me here is, and thank you for the question, Solomon. How can I work on, on disease prevention at, at farm level? Uh, 
one of the veterans of disease control says to me, biosecurity is the number one thing. Uh, when we fight diseases with vaccine, it's only one portion of the intervention. But if you can imagine, if you farming in an area that has no fences, you cannot prevent your animals from mingling with other animals whose health status is unknown, for example. So I would say if you are fortunate enough to be on farmland, you start by making sure you have proper fences, uh, not just pieces of wood and wire, but fences that can prevent uh, unnecessary or unpermitted animal movement. And then the second would be to make sure that uh, everybody that works with animals is aware of what a healthy animal looks like and what a sick animal looks like. But again, when we're talking vaccines, we, we're not even talking sick animals yet. So my, my suggestion is uh, keep the animals safe by having your fencing, control movement, not everyone that uh, visit you has to have access to the animals. Make sure when people visit you, uh, they don't, not everyone has to be inside your crawl because we, in terms of biosecurity, we carry all sorts of other things on our shoes, on our hands, on our clothes everywhere. And that is very important to make sure that uh, we 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 do not introduce unnecessary pathogens into our animals. So if if one can put it simply, if 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 we could have it our way, if you don't want to have sick animals, we say don't have animals. But then I would be talking to the wrong audience on this on this platform. So one of the ways we can make sure uh, animals don't get sick is to make sure that. We avoid contact between the animals and the source of the disease. And that's where fencing and other biosecurity measures come in. Uh, there's what we call the, the triad, or the, I can call it a tripartite alliance of the host, the pathogen, as well as the environment. If you think about it, of all the things that we have control and influence over, the environment is the least we can do much about. We can't do anything about uh, global warming, for example, but we can maybe move to a place in the country where a certain disease doesn't exist or where not many diseases don't exist. If you don't have the luxury to move, then you have to help animals to deal with the disease where, where, where you are. We don't have control on the pathogens or the disease agents that make animals sick. Uh, maybe other than, for example, when we have foot and mouth, you'll see at roadblocks, we, we spray vehicles, we spray people, we put on protective wear. But the key thing is the host itself or your animal itself. At any point in time, we want to make sure that an animal always has an upper hand against the disease. And that we achieve through vaccination, and we achieve through making sure that we have healthy animals that have adequate access to nutrition. Because when the animals are sick, your vaccines are not going to help you in any way. Thank you very much, Dr. Mavoy. That was uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, I'm just going to take the second question that I we get we got from the from our inbox. Uh, we got a question from uh, Pimelo. Majila, he asked, what are the symptoms for lumpy skin disease, uh, Dr. Mabu? Okay. Uh, Pimelo, thanks for the question. That's a good question. You may have joined us a bit late. I've got pictures of lumpy skin disease on a cow, but basically, like the name says, it's actually a lot of lumps on the skin, and it's the most common disease that causes lumps in animals. There may be lumps caused by other things in, in animals. We also have a disease called pseudo lumpy skin. But as we the old people say, common things happen commonly. So if you see the lumps on an animal like the one I've showed in the presentation, 
and the season is most likely the rainy season, you immediately think of lumpy skin until uh, proven otherwise. But of course, the disease has to be confirmed. So if you suspect a disease like that, you need to notify your local animal health technician, your state vet, and they also have a duty to help you confirm the disease. And by law, actually, because lumpy skin is a notifiable disease, you have to report even before you confirm it, just a mere suspicion of a notifiable disease. Absolutely fantastic. So we're going to go to our third question. Uh, just to remind you guys, don't be shy to raise up your hand uh, so that you can uh, ask your question uh, directly instead of reading your question from in the inbox. So by then we go forward to our next question is uh, from Cassius. Uh, Cassius asks, do you have a complete vaccination program for cows until they are at least a year old? I am interested in knowing what to prevent for and from what age, Dr. Mabul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cassius. Uh, the, the suggested vaccination program that I've put on the slides there is actually the base that you start with. And depending on your individual areas, we can always modify it to best suit your area. But the four to eight months, like I mentioned, uh, with heifers, you make sure that they are covered for brucellosis. Very early when they are three weeks, for example, you make sure they are covered uh, against the lung diseases because pathogens that get that cause lung diseases, uh, the calves get from their mothers immediately after they get uh, born. Uh, and the only reason they stay healthy is because the pathogens or the bacteria are still in the upper respiratory tract. If the animals undergoes a lot of stress whatever for whatever reason, that's when the bacteria migrate down into the lungs and cause disease. So you do your brucellosis, you do your uh, pasturella. Uh, when they are around four to six months, you do your clostridial diseases. That is your black cotta, your botulism, your, your anthrax. Anthrax is, by the way, also a legal obligation for every farmer that owns a, a ruminant animal in South Africa, a domestic animal. And then one would look at other viral diseases like your uh, IBR, PI3 and BRSV that quite often exist in combination uh, with others in, in vaccines that are commercially available. But feel free to please contact me if you want us to discuss in a lot more detail, a customized vaccination program for your specific area. What I put up on the slides there is just examples and, and suggested uh, vaccinations for, for calves. Absolutely. Uh, just to add on that as well, uh, the OVP and the RMIT uh, is now working on a proposed head health program that is going to be also shared with the, the farmers uh, across the country as well, so that uh, you can be able to, to use it uh, to prevent some diseases in your farm. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to move to the next question. Uh, it's from Tavo uh, Marana. He says, greeting farmers. Uh, question number one, what are what are after effects when injecting or vaccinating all animals with one needle? That is very important. And question number two, he also asks, what must I use to prevent this disease on my farm when, when I'm doing multi-animal farming like the piggery, the goats, the cattle, as well as the chickens. I think that is a very interesting question. And, and uh, I'm very interested with uh, the answer that uh, Dr. Mavu is going to give. I think it's a very critical one and very important because here you're not farming only with a uh, cattle uh, or goat and sheep. You also have some chickens and that can also be complex in terms of uh, disease control. Uh, Dr. Mavu. Okay. Dr. Marana, thanks for your question. Uh, it's not advisable to use one needle on multiple animals. 
that's 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 the first line. We know under field conditions, it's not always practical to be changing a needle from one animal to another. For example, if you're vaccinating 100 animals, I don't expect you to be standing in a crawl with 100 needles. However, there are exceptions. If you're going to be vaccinating in the middle of an outbreak, for example, you're going to vaccinate for lumpy skin when you already have a few animals exhibiting the signs in your crawl, or even in your immediate environment, whether it's a neighbor, because it could suggest that you have animals that are already incubating the disease, and it's only a matter of time before it actually starts showing on the outside. In that case, I say you try everything possible to minimize the number of animals that share a needle. In fact, if, 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 if it was my animals, and I know there's a risk of transmitting a disease from one animal to another with a needle, I would never make them share a needle, especially in the middle of an outbreak. So what is a practical is sometimes when you go and, 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 and vaccinate these animals and you don't have a lot of needles with you, we always recommend that you take a pot or a gas stove where you can make fire or you can make fire on the ground and boil these needles uh, and cool them down. There's nothing that uh, can do this uh, cleaning job on the needles better than boiling water. Put these needles in boiling water, flush as much boiling water as possible through these needles, let them cool down, don't attach hot needles onto your syringe, and that way you can actually minimize the risk of, of disease transmission within a herd. Because what sometimes happens is, uh, for example, a disease might take, a vaccine might take 14 days to give you full protection from a disease, but the animal needs only about seven days to get sick from a disease if it gets exposed at vaccination. So the disease will be running ahead of your vaccine if you're going to be infecting your animals with a dirty needle. One other thing that I would also recommend is there are, I think now after COVID, we got exposed to sanitizers uh, and we still have a lot of them lying around. Try and avoid using this disinfectant, chemical disinfectants to clean needles, especially when you are vaccinating what we call live vaccines, because what these chemicals actually do, they will kill the vaccine. And lumpy skin is one of uh, the examples of live viruses that we use in a vaccine. So when you are vaccinating for lumpy skin or you're vaccinating for anthrax, you stay away from your chemical disinfectants in your needles. And that's where you stick purely with hot water and let the needles uh, cool down. Uh, the second part of the question was about multiple species on a farm. Uh, when you have multiple species on a farm, my suggestion is have a vaccination program for each species. Uh, and, 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 and for example, your, your cattle will have a vaccination program for cattle. Your pigs will have a vaccination program for pigs. With pigs, I would worry more about uh, the pig diseases themselves more than whatever they can pick up from other species. So worry first about pig diseases in pigs before you worry about uh, cattle giving your pigs anything, which is actually quite rare, especially if your pigs are not free roaming pigs. But there are other diseases like your mycoplasma pneumonias in pigs that you have to worry about. There's other important pig diseases uh, to think of. And the same way with, with chickens. Uh, you have certain diseases like Newcastle that we have to vaccinate for, but Quite often, if you don't have a lot of chickens, you don't really want to be uh, vaccinating for diseases that have not even occurred in your area for the last five years, for example. If a disease hasn't been diagnosed in your immediate environment for the last five years, unless the risk is really, really high. For example, 
uh, with Newcastle, if you if you if you live in high risk areas or there is a high risk that your animals can get exposed, you need to have a full vaccination program for your chickens as well. Absolutely, absolutely important. Uh, before I go to the other questions that we have on the inside the box, uh, we just I'm just going to ask another question that I always get from the presentation that I make or the engagement that I do with the farmers on the ground. They always ask me this question. What actually is the difference between the live and the killed vaccine? Is there any different? Yes, absolutely, uh, Ernest. The, the live vaccine will actually have the actual bugs that cause the disease. For example, lumpy skin will have the live virus in there, just in a weakened form that cannot cause a disease. And then if we have, if we talk about an inactivated vaccine, for example, it will be where the, the virus has been chemically inactivated, meaning that it cannot even cause the, even the mildest form of disease. The difference also with, between the two is the inactivated vaccines, the immunity doesn't seem to last that long. For example, if, if we have to use the Rift Valley fever as an example, we have the live vaccine and we have an inactivated vaccine. The live vaccine, we give it as a once off vaccination, whereas the inactivated one needs a booster. So you give it for the first time to an animal, you have to follow up with a booster in four to six weeks because the immunity doesn't last very long. Absolutely. With that being said, uh, is it safe to vaccinate a pregnant cattle with a live vaccine? OK, the vaccinating live animals uh, or live, vaccinating animals with a live vaccine carries the risk that a pregnant animal can abort. Unless the manufacturer of a vaccine has done the work and has demonstrated safety in pregnancy, as a general rule, we try to stay away from, from, from pregnant animals with any live vaccines. Unless there is data that has been produced uh, to say that you can use them safely. So a lot of vaccine manufacturers, uh, when they register the vaccine, uh, it is sometimes a requirement for them to demonstrate upfront the, the safety of the vaccine uh, used in pregnant animals. So if it's not safe to use in pregnant animals, they will tell you, for example, not to use uh, in a pregnant animals. Uh, with certain vaccines that I've seen also live vaccines, if, uh, for example, vaccines, live vaccines for um bovine viral diarrhea for example if the animals have been vaccinated as young heifers with that live vaccine they can still be safely vaccinated in pregnancy with the same vaccine but if they've never been exposed to a live bvd vaccine you definitely don't want to take a risk uh, with a live vaccine for the first time in a pregnant animal Absolutely, absolutely. Very important because some of the farmers, uh, they don't have information regarding this uh, difference between the live vaccine and the killed vaccine, and then when to use it and how to use it as well. I find this very, very important because uh, even though some of the farmers, they don't do the pregnancy test, but it's very important. It worth knowing that uh, when to vaccinate, uh, and when to use the date or when to use the, the live vaccine. I'm going to go back to the inbox and then read some of the questions that we received. Uh, there's this question that we got from uh, most of you asking if we could send you the slides. Uh, we want to publish our recording or the recording of this particular webinar on our website or on our YouTube channel, uh, Kuluma, uh, the Red Meat Kuluma which translate the red meat talk or speak. So, so this is our, our studio in the red meat industry.
Uh, this is where we host our webinars on a monthly basis. So the recording of this, uh, this webinar will be published on the YouTube channel and the link will be shared with everyone uh, who want to listen to everything that was discussed. Uh, we avoid sharing the slides because uh, the slide you may misinterpret them. So it's easy to follow what was uh, presented through the recording. So the next question that was asked is from uh, Cassius, who asked, please comment on the narration that the leftover of the leftover vaccines can be used again after being stored couple couple of weeks or months in the fridge. The questions the question is, can we use the uh, uh, the vaccine that we already opened and then store them in the fridge. Is it safe to use those type of vaccine? That's the, the nub of the question, uh, Dr. Silo. Okay. Thanks, Ernest, and thanks, Dr. Cassius, for the question. The simple answer to that is no, absolutely not. Uh, if you read the package insets that come with the vaccines, uh, a lot of companies will put it there explicitly that once the vaccine bottle is opened, please use it up and, 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 and finish it the same day. And that is also to cover themselves in case you vaccinate a week later with the same vaccines and animals die because the vaccine was uh, ineffective. But I want to take this a step back and say the reason that uh, a recommendation is actually made is because under field conditions, it's not possible that you will get a needle going in and out of the bottle multiple times and not have contamination happening. So these vaccines inevitably get contaminated with the number of times a needle goes in and out. And the vaccine, because it's not, it doesn't have any chemicals that kill uh, the viruses or bacteria that can enter it. Some of the vaccines can actually even have uh, uh, things that help uh, things grow inside the bottle there. So if you introduce bacteria inside the vaccine bottle, there's a chance that those bacteria may multiply while the vaccine is sitting in the fridge. So it is generally not recommended uh, purely for safety reasons. And, and if you think about it also, if you're going to be vaccinating the next time, you don't want to be taking the entire day of your calendar to uh, gather animals, pack them in a crush pen, have utilized all the labors or, or all the labor that you can find and end up having no immune animals because you used an ineffective vaccine. You used a vaccine that got contaminated and stopped working the day you put it back in the fridge. So in terms of the risk, I still say it's not worth it. Uh, most manufacturers will say, even if you don't finish it uh, at the same time, but as long as the vaccine is used up same day, and what this means is even if you have to donate it to your neighbor, put it back in the cooler box and drive a few kilometers and donate it to someone that can make use of that vaccine instead of throwing it away or pushing it back into the fridge. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sololo. Uh, we just got some few comments uh, and, and and uh, I think this should be our last question, unless there's someone who want to uh, go live and ask a Dr. Solo question. Uh, please don't be shy. I'm gonna read out this uh, this question to Dr. Solo. That one is from Dumelo. Dumelo ask, what happens if you did not boast animals? Can you still vaccinate with the same vaccine yearly, or you should boast first? And what happens if the season of vaccinating that particular vaccine this past, I mean, has passed on the Dr. Sal. Okay. Jumelo, thank you very much for the question. Uh, in terms of the booster, there is a reason why a booster is recommended. So when 
we do vaccine research. We vaccinate them first time and we realize that uh, animals that did not. OK, let me put it this way. For a vaccine that says you need a booster, you have to boost. And the reason for that is work would have been done to prove that one vaccination uh, on its own is not sufficient. So you will have done the vaccination, but it will be incomplete, meaning that the animals are still exposed and there's still a risk that they may die of the disease. One key example is botulism. Uh, you cannot protect botulism with one shot of a botulism vaccine. You have to give a booster. It's actually been proven that the second one is the one that actually just puts the cherry on top in as far as the animal's protection is concerned. And then you have farmers that are using chicken litter, for example, as a protein supplement in winter. And with those farmers, we even say, go as far as doing your botulism twice a year. So if you've done it once and you've boosted, go ahead and still use it again after six months. It cannot do animals any harm, but if the animals are exposed to botulism toxins, they may actually die. So if a vaccine specifically says you must use a booster, go ahead and boost it. And there's a difference also with the, the wording that is sometimes used, because sometimes when we say booster is when we do the four to six weeks, but if an animal has been vaccinated with lumpy skin, for example, this year, and we say give it annually, that annual one going forward is also a booster. And, and because with lumpy skin, we don't recommend that you boost in four to six weeks, but all the subsequent vaccinations for the uh, lumpy skin on the same animal actually are your booster vaccinations. I didn't see the second part of the question. Uh, can we scroll down to? OK, what happens if the season for vaccinating for a particular with a particular vaccine has passed? Jamila, that's a very good question, this one also. And I'll tell you why. We, with global warming, you've been seeing, we've been seeing uh, some of the diseases actually occurring in our animals right through the year. With lumpy skin, for example, we know the peak uh, risk season for lumpy skin, but it's not uncommon to find lumpy skin even in winter. It's not uncommon, especially after it has been discovered that the transmission of, of lumpy skin is not limited only to flying insects. There are ticks that are known now uh, with research to transmit a lumpy skin disease. And in areas that are not too cold for ticks to survive, these infected ticks can actually still go and transmit disease even outside the peak season for the disease that we normally know. So for me, I say the in my in my head, there's no such a thing as having missed a season. If you have a vaccine, use it. It works better inside the animal than in the fridge waiting for the correct season. I've also seen in the last few years uh, diseases like black quarter happening outside the traditional period we expect them. So don't wait if you have a vaccine in your fridge. Don't wait until August, September to vaccinate for your Clostridials. As long as you keep to vaccinating animals every 12 months, you're making sure that you're keeping them above the flood line at all times. So yes, the reason why we recommend vaccinating at a specific time is so that when the animals come across the risk, they also it also coincides with the time when they have the most protection from the vaccine because the vaccine protection does not last forever. With time, it starts a dipping, but it will still be protecting animals if it's above a certain threshold. But by all means, even if you've missed the season, I still recommend that you vaccinate. Uh, uh, don't wait for the next vaccination season. Vaccinate the animals as long as it is safe to do so with a vaccine you have in your hand. 
Uh, one of the comments that we received from Kessia says, a great session, thank you, and thank you to uh, uh, Kessia. And the next question says, can you vaccinate for multiple diseases within the same day? That's a very interesting question, Dr. Sello. Yes, uh, Andile. Andile, thank you for the question. Absolutely, you can vaccinate for multiple diseases. That is why in the market today we have combination vaccines. Combination vaccines also offer you the convenience of doing three, four diseases at the same time in one syringe, one needle. And then you don't have to go and prick the animal four times if you can have the disease in a in a combination in a combination in, in, in that vaccine. So absolutely yes. But the next level of the question, same question that I sometimes get is how many is actually too many? How many vaccines can you pack into an animal at the same time? Uh, and, 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 and I want to put it this way. It's like going to the gym and you want to work on your body. But when the personal trainer asks you, you say, I want to do everything. If you go to the gym with, with an intention of doing everything, then you're not going to get effective training of any specific muscle groups. If you want a six pack, but you're going to spend 70% of the time uh, doing your legs and your, your, your arms, then your six pack is not going to be the way you want it to be. You may still get it, but it's not going to be the same as the guy that goes into the gym with a focus on a six pack and he does exactly what he wants and, and, and focusing on a six pack. So yes, you can do multiple diseases. There's always a limit, especially when it comes to live vaccines. Ideally, even if you do multiple vaccines at once, I recommend that you do not mix more than one live vaccine at a time. And thank you so much. I hope I've clarified it. Absolutely, absolutely clarified. I see someone's hand is up there. Uh, Paki, Paki, can you unmute your mic? Yeah, I yes, hope please. you can hear me now. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I just maybe just two comments, you know, for my ignorance. Does OBP actually supply directly to farmers? That's the, the one question. And the other thing I always see in the media about some shortage of vaccines and so on. And how, how true is that? Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Paki. Very good questions, uh, Dr. Sala. Okay, Paki. Thank, 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 Panky. Panky, thanks for for the question. Uh, OBP does supply directly to farmers. It's not the most practical thing uh, uh, for various reasons. We supply co-ops and wholesalers, and and a lot of times farmers go there because a co-op will be like a one-stop shop. But if we have a farmer that comes in specifically looking for a vaccine and we have it, we're not going to turn you away. There's just other practicalities uh, when it comes to supplying one bottle to a farmer, for example, uh, and taking resources from people that would have been packing a load uh, going to a co-op or a wholesaler. So it just has logistical implications and it, it's not the most convenient thing for us to do. So we advise farmers to buy directly from co-ops and other shops that are buying from us. But if you happen to be in the vicinity, we're not going to send you away. If the vaccine is available, we'll definitely make it available to you. Uh, unless if it's a vaccine that is supplied only to veterinarians, for example. In terms of stock uh, shortages, uh, I will, I will, I will, I will put it this way: OBP has had challenges, like any other company under the sun, where the demand will outstrip the supply. Uh, it does happen once in a while that we run out of certain vaccines, certain products, like certain companies would run out of uh, 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 products. And like I said, when 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 demand far outstrips the supply, with lumpy skin, for example, 
if everybody waits until there's an outbreak, then you will not find stocks that are sufficient to satisfy an immediate need. It takes a long time to manufacture a vaccine from the beginning to the end. And unfortunately, even with a lot of competitors internationally, they will tell you when the demand shifts unexpectedly, it can take up to six months for any manufacturer to catch up. Unless if they were manufacturing excess stock that they keep as reserves. But one also needs to keep in mind that we have we manufacture products that have a certain shelf life. So in a country that needs 100,000, you're not going to go and manufacture 300,000, for example, because you still have to account for whatever is not used up and you have to throw away. So there's always that fine balance between the demand and supply. But yes, uh, manufacturing once in a while does encounter challenges like everyone else that uses machines. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for the answer, Dr. Silo. Uh, I'm just going to take, uh, uh, I see the hand is up there is Litavo Lisiani. Could you please unmute yourself and, and, and ask the question? Uh, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Mabue, uh, Mr. Makua, and good evening. Good morning to colleagues. Uh, my question is this. Clostridial diseases are known to uh, have produce what we call endospores, which will help them become resistant to external environments. My question is, if your animal is ever infected with any of clostridial diseases, Will these diseases be resistant to antibiotics if ever you have missed uh, to vaccinate your animal or if ever your animal is in fact infected with clostridial diseases? Absolutely. Very good question. And then amongst others, for those who don't know what is referring to clostridial diseases, amongst others referring to uh, black quarter, botulism and so forth. So, so these are some of the deadly diseases. Uh, uh, so you need to vaccinate for those diseases if you have them around your area. So uh, that's a very good question, uh, Dr. Sello. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. I think NS has already summed it up nicely for us. The only way you're going to build up a resistance uh, against clostridial diseases is to vaccinate uh, against uh, these diseases. The, the spores that you get with clostridial uh, group uh, do respond to uh, penicillin treatments, for example, but the success rate is so low that it's not actually worth it uh, missing a vaccination and hoping you will treat. Uh, and in fact, a lot of these are very deadly diseases. If an animal gets infected with black quarter, there's a 90 or 99 percent chance that it will die. So there's no way that we can even talk reinfection and repeat infections with 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 black quarter. This animal will literally just drop dead. Uh, so it is always a good idea to rather stick to the vaccinations. Uh, there are there used to be uh, what we call hyperimmune serum that was administered to these animals when they get sick. Uh, that would be almost like a super concentrated uh, vaccine that you force into these animals, but it hasn't been economically feasible and OBP stopped uh, producing hyperimmune serum for these clostridial diseases many years ago before I even joined. So it's always a good idea to rather stick with the vaccine and prevent the disease rather. Very, very interesting. And 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 with, with sorry to interrupt, uh, Ernest, with clostridial diseases like black quarter, we know that the most vulnerable animals with black quarters is the young ones up to about three years. So we can actually say uh, if your resources are limited, uh, you can actually skip animals that are older than three years if your vaccine is not enough, you can uh, prioritize the younger ones. But if you have leftover vaccine, go ahead and vaccinate older ones. 
It doesn't mean all the animals do not get killed by, by black quarter, but it is rare. Absolutely, very important. Thank you very much, Dr. Sirulo. You're going to take our last question and, and we're going to sum up the, the session for today. I, I see there's a comment there by uh, Rebani Useyile says, very informative presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sirulo Mavue and Ernest Magua. Thank you to you too, uh, Rebani. Uh, our last question comes from Tolo. There's a girl. He says, hi, Dr. Do we have diseases for animals that cannot be controlled by vaccines or be treated? And if the answer is yes, what are those diseases? Dr. Magui? Uh, Dr. Tolo, thanks for the question. The simple answer to that is yes, absolutely. Remember, science, science uh, includes discovering new things every day. Uh, we didn't know about COVID in humans until a few years ago, but it doesn't mean the virus didn't exist. It's a matter of uh, the disease being identified. Uh, the same in animals. There are a lot of diseases actually that we do not have treatment for, we do not have vaccines for. And one classical example that comes to mind is African swine fever in South Africa. We know that when African swine fever breaks out in piggeries, it wipes out everything and literally cl can close a piggery down. There's no treatment, there's no vaccine, but research work is ongoing and hopefully one day we can have a different discussion when there's a, an effective commercial vaccine against uh, African swine fever. Another example is a disease called bovine leukosis or enzootic bovine leukosis. It's caused by a leukemia virus. Uh, it occurs worldwide. Uh, we have it in South Africa. And uh, not all animals that are infected end up developing the disease. Just like HIV and AIDS, not everyone that has HIV ending up with AIDS. A lot of these animals can continue living productive lives until they get culled for other reasons. But yes, we do have bovine leukemia in South Africa, for which we have no vaccine or antibiotic treatment. Thank you very much, Dr. Mawue. Uh, so as I make my last question to Dr. Mawue, could you please, if there's any of you who have suggestions in terms of uh, the topics that you'd like us, the Aramited, to cover going forward in our webinars, could you please, in, a, in 30 seconds, just drop the title of those topics or just raise up your hand as I'm going to ask the last question to Dr. Mavue. Okay, uh, Dr. Mavue, uh, thank you very much to start with for honoring our invitation. We're very honored to have you in our studio today at Aramai TED, the Red Meat Industry Columa Studio. Uh, so my last question to you is with regard to, to the information about the vaccinations. And, and where where can the farmers get those vaccines? Just mention a few of the vaccines that the, the OVP uh, provide to the farmers that they can use to prevent against the diseases. And where in particular can the farmers get those vaccines? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I want to take the opportunity also to thank the RMI TED for the invitation. Uh, this means a lot to us and 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 we we really feel honored to be part of the webinar today. The products uh, OBP makes more than 50 different vaccines. We are actually the largest animal vaccine manufacturing company in South Africa. Uh, you will hear people say the tallest tree always catches the most wind. Uh, we are the tallest tree that catches everything that, that comes our way. If you go onto our website, we have a specific page that has all our products that we've broken down by species. So if you're looking for all products, you can find them in one page. If you're looking for cattle products only, we have a page for cattle products only. So all the products that you need will be on the website there. 
And what we've done is with every product that we've placed on the website, there is a package inset. So you don't have to go to a co-op and buy a vaccine and only get information once you open the box. That leaflet that you find inside the vaccine box is available on our website. You can actually read all the precautions before you even go and buy the vaccine. The vaccines are available at different co-ops uh, throughout the country. We are trying also to empower young entrepreneurs in deep rural areas that are interested in establishing their own businesses. We encourage them to, 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 to open accounts with OBP and supply these vaccines to farmers. It is possible for farmers to have access to vaccines without having to catch a bus or a taxi to town because that money could be money that you could have used to actually cover more animals with the vaccine. Uh, with uh, certain uh, co-ops, you are able to go onto their website and they will be able to tell you if they have the stock of our vaccine. For people that live in the Northwest, a very good example is the NWK uh, co-op, which by the way, actually services countrywide because they tell me they can courier product anywhere in the country. If you download an app called NWK Shop on your phone, any product that is sold at a co-op, you can actually find it on that app and you can get a price and you can get an idea of the stock levels that they have. So that by the time you drive to a co-op, you already know that you're driving for a product that you've seen in their stock list. And if you're looking for a product that a co-op does not keep, please feel free to contact us directly. My contact details are on the presentation. Uh, sometimes I've, I've encountered co-ops that would tell customers that OBP doesn't have stock when we actually have stock. Unfortunately, there's not enough of us uh, on the ground to be countering that all the time. So if you have questions about stock availability, feel free to contact us directly. Some of the stock we do have, and we don't want it to expire in our fridges if it can be used to help people. Absolutely encouraging. It is what it is uh, in line with the Aramited vision of which is to foster stakeholder engagement towards inclusive growth through the transfer of knowledge. It is what it is today that we just provided you with is the knowledge so that it can be able to use in your farm so that you can make profit. The main purpose is to make profit in your farm so that you can be able to thrive as a farmer. So we're empowering farmers to thrive. So uh, our next webinar, we're going to have a presentation that is related to nutrition. So just look out for that uh, invitation. So, uh, so that you can also be able to attend and gain more knowledge that's going to help you as a farmer to be able to, to make profit in your farm and, and to manage uh, your farm in a way that is not going to make you lose a lot of money. So uh, we are now uh, reached to a stage whereby we're going to close uh, our session for today. Uh, I would like to appreciate everyone who, I see someone's hand is up, I'm going to just allow you to 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 say whatever you want to say and then we're closing it down. Uh, who is that? Is Gilbert Matsunya? Please, please just keep it short and simple uh, so that we don't extend it any longer. Uh, Gilbert, just switch on your mic and then uh, and platform is yours. Good, 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 good day, everybody. Uh, Doug, I heard you saying you have uh, a situation where you have developed uh, upcoming entrepreneurs in your distribution. Can you elaborate a little bit, please? Yes, uh, it's it's. What I was saying is, we constantly looking for new customers. We constantly looking for people that believe they can sell the vaccine on to other farmers. Obviously, it comes with uh, you understanding that it's a a, a cold chain product. Uh, so ideally, we say if if you have backup power wherever you are. I don't want you to open an account and call me later and say we had load shedding, the vaccines are off. Uh, I would really encourage you to make contact with us if you're interested. 
uh, you you do apply there's forms that you complete and you have people that will look at your application and tell you whether it was successful or not so you definitely can apply uh, because we see it also as you helping other farmers if you're interested in in being one of the distributors for the vaccines absolutely fantastic thank you very much uh, dr mavoy uh, we are working with uh, various stakeholders within the red meat industry to ensure that uh, we provide you farmers with the information that's going to be uh, uh, helpful to you so that you can be able to grow your farms. Uh, in future, you're going to still invite various speakers. It could be uh, with regard to vaccination. It could be with regard to the uh, to nutrition itself and so forth. So just keep in touch with us. We always gonna send out the invite uh, for the upcoming webinars on our uh, websites. Uh, it could be Facebook, Instagram, or even LinkedIn. Just uh, keep on following our pages on social media to ensure that you don't miss out to any of our webinars. So I would like to thank everyone who attended the webinar with us today. And I'm, I would like to say that we appreciate you. We appreciate your time. And we're looking forward to working with your farmers to ensure that uh, we provide you with information that uh, is going to be uh, crucial for you to grow and transform from emerging farmers to, to the commercial farmers. Even the students who are attending here, we appreciate you. And other people who are inspiring farmers who are not yet farmers, uh, we also appreciate you. And uh, we are very sure that uh, with the information that we provide you with, you're going to be able to, to thrive and, and, and apply it in your farms or in your future uh, plans. Uh, remember, uh, failing to plan is a, is, is a planning to fail. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and thank you to Dr. Mavoy. Much appreciated. Thank, thank you, you for the invitation. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, team.